So um, good morning uh, from Sydney. Um, I'd like to first acknowledge that I'm presenting today from Gadigal land where I live and I work and I pay my respects to um, elders past, present and emerges. Um, I will generously describe myself as having graying hair. Um, I have uh, Harry Potter-esque glasses, a red top and I'm in front of my bookshelves at home. Today I am focusing on two individuals, Claudius Ptolemy and Michael Silvertis, and their intersection in one of the most influential books of the Renaissance, Ptolemy's Geographia, a text which had significant influence in the development of geography and mapping and the age of European exploration. Uh, next slide, please. Ptolemy was a Greek, most likely born in Egypt and living in Alexandria in the first century up to 150 AD. Although past its glory days, Alexandria was still regarded as the capital of knowledge and learning, in part because of the great library of Alexandria, which held the work of many important and influential scholars. Ptolemy was a mathematician, astronomer, geographer, and published several important works on science, astronomy, and geography. One of Ptolemy's most famous works was the Almagest, a treatise on astronomy. Ptolemy produced a catalogue of the heavens, including around a thousand stars grouped into constellations. For each star, Ptolemy indicated the longitude and latitude in relation to the ecliptic. Ptolemy's greatest geographical work, Geographia, was a descriptive atlas and instruction manual on how to draw a map of the inhabited lands. Many of the conventions that Ptolemy introduced through his geographical um, theories became fundamental elements of map making in later centuries. For example, on a map, north is at the top and east is to the right. The distance between the equator and each pole is measured in 90 degrees of latitude with the equator at zero. The distance around the earth is measured in 360 degrees of longitude. As the prime meridian, Ptolemy used the Canary Islands, the most Western known point at the time. Latitudinal lines were an earlier idea, but Ptolemy took this concept and extended it to include longitudinal lines, calling lines of latitude parallels and lines of longitude meridians. In the second half of the treatise, Ptolemy recorded the longitude and latitude of over 8,000 cities with geographic features, lands, rivers, mountains, lakes. One of Ptolemy's unfortunate legacies was the miscalculation of the circumference of the earth, which he um, guessed at around 28% smaller than it really was. Next slide, please. Um, Ptolemy died around 150 AD, and there is much debate about the use of his works for the next 1,000 years. His theories are referenced in various Greek texts, but the complete work was not introduced into Europe until around the 14th century. The Greek text was first translated into Latin, possibly by a Florentine scholar, Jacobus Angelus. In 1406, it was partially translated into Arabic at some stage as well. Many of the early Greek manuscripts were beautiful, large format productions, likely commissioned by wealthy patrons or produced as a gift to a potential sponsor. The later copies translated into Latin were also painstakingly copied by hand. There is no evidence that Ptolemy ever created a map. If he did, none have survived. The maps were created from the 14th century using the coordinates instru and instructions compiled by Ptolemy. Um, next slide, please. These two images are from the 14th century Burney um, Manuscript 111 from the British Library um, on parchment. Um, if you have a look at this map here, you'll see it's really just concentrating on Northern Europe and the top of Africa, which is really the only known lands at that particular period. And the Indian Ocean is completely landlocked. Uh, next slide, please. Various editions in manuscript of the Latin translations were circulated through the 15th century. And then in 1475, the first printed copy of Ptolemy's book appeared. The first printing without maps. And then in 1477, an edition was published in Bologna with 26 engraved maps, essentially an atlas of the ancient world printed in the modern one. Over the next 50 years, various editions of Ptolemy's atlas were produced. The simple maps became more decorative with details of geographic features, mountains, rivers, cities, sometimes adding monsters, and usually with chubby cheeked wind heads. This 1511 Ptolemaic map here has no title and very little 
decoration, although to the left you can see the indication of climates and to the right you can see zodiac signs. Um, I'm just thinking if you have your slides at the full size, you'll see these images better. Um, so this um, map was passed through the print printing press twice. So it's in fact the first map printed in two colors with the, with the capitals actually in red. And this is from a 1511 um, copy of Ptolemy. The greatest difference with each edition was the inclusion of more maps reflecting the modern world, the inclusion of more locations with their relevant coordinates. And in 1524, a German humanist, Wilbelt Perkheimer, completed a new translation in Strasbourg and it was published in 1524-25 by Johann Gruniger with an additional 24 maps supplementing the original 26 of the ancient world. The maps for this edition were produced and edited by Lawrence Fries. Between 1522 to 1525, Fries worked with Gruniger as a cartographer, including three new maps of Southeast Asia, East Indies and China. Next slide, please. And now to Servetus. Outside Paris, the only significant centre of printing in France in the early 16th century was Lyon, with Paris under the watchful eye of the Roman Catholic theologians. Lyon was able to publish humanist and Protestant works more freely. Among its foremost printers were Johann Trexel and his sons Melchior and Caspar. In the early 1530s, the Trexels decided to produce a new edition of Geographia based on the early Perkheimer translation possibly because they had acquired the text and maps of the Ptolemy from Gruniger after his death or from his estate. The early edition of Fries' uh, work published by Gruniger is very rare, rare, suggesting that the work was not commercially successful. This was Trexel's chance to produce a more successful edition. The Trexels needed an editor for this new edition and they engaged the services of um, Michael Villanueva, Villanovas, also known as Michael Servetus. Michael Servetus was born in Spain. The date of his birth is unknown, although it is thought to be around 1511. When he was around 15 years old, he traveled to Toulouse where he studied law, learned Greek and Hebrew, studied the Bible, later traveling extensively through Italy and France. In 1531, Servetus published a treatise, De Trinitatis Aerobius, on the errors of the Trinity. It included a denial of the existence of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As you can imagine, it was badly received by the Catholic Church, and he was considered a heretic by Christian religious authorities. John Calvin, the major figure in the Protestant Reformation, considered him an enemy, and the two exchanged letters voicing their opposing theological views. Following the controversy, Servetus disappeared and later re-emerged in Lyon as a young man calling himself Michel de Villeneuve, a, re a religious refugee from Paris and a fugitive from the Inquisition. Next slide, please. Servetus was employed by the Trexels to edit the new edition of Geographia. This was completed in 1535 under his pseudonym. He had spent two years reviewing and revising the text for the publication. Geographia was not the only text Villeneuve edited. He also read and corrected medical texts, including a French pharmaceutical guide. In 1536, Servetus traveled to Paris to study medicine, becoming a respected doctor, his identity remaining a secret. However, undaunted and sure of his convictions, in 1553, Servetus produced another publication, Christianisme Restitutio, a theological work which also included the first European description of the circulation of the blood through the lungs. Servetus thought that if the soul is in the blood, the best way to understand its journey through the human body was to study the blood circulation. The vital spirit has its origin in the left ventricle of the heart, he writes, and the lungs contribute mostly to its production. It is produced in the lungs when the air inhaled is in combined with the elaborated subtle blood that the right ventricle of the heart transmits to the left. But this communication does not take place through the middle wall of the heart as it is usually believed, but rather by means of a great contrivance, the subtle blood is pumped forward from the right ventricle of the heart to a large circuit through the lungs. He published this description of the function of the lungs, heart and arteries in his massive theological opus, using not his pseudonym, but his own name. The accused heretic had outed himself and could no longer hide under his assumed name. Next slide, please. Servetus was, uh, was eventually arrested and underwent a public trial in Geneva. He was convicted of heresy. There were 40 counts of heresy against him. 
Among the first complaints was a claim that he has not ceased by all means in his power to scatter his poison as much by construction of biblical text as by certain annotations which he has made upon Ptolemy. The pieces of evidence used at his trial was the text on the verso of this Holy, Lo Holy Land map in the 1535 edition of Ptolemy's geography. And on the back of the map, the text reads, and so most excellent reader, you should realize that in error and pure exaggeration, a reputation for excellence was bestowed on this land. However, the testimony of merchants and travelers removed from this inhospitable and barren land, lacking every attraction, any reputation for excellence. Therefore, this so-called promised land should not be praised in a vernacular language. This description of an inhospitable but inhospitable and barren land was considered by the religious authorities to be blasphemous. Calvin asserted that the text had contradicted the description of the Holy Land in the book of Exodus as a land flowing with milk and honey. Ironically, the controversial passage was not original to Servetus, but was simply copied by him from previous editions of Ptolemy's geography, which were published in 1522 and 1525 by Laurent Fries. Next slide, please. In 1553, Servetus was sentenced to be burned at the stake with his books. It was presumed and intended that every copy of his books on the circulation of the blood was destroyed, but three copies survived, along with many copies of the 1535 Ptolemy. Uh, this is an excerpt, an excerpt from a 1953 publication by John Farquhar Fulton titled Michael Servetus, Humanist and Martyr. Bound to the stake by the iron chain with a chaplet of straw and green twigs covered with sulphur on his head, with his long dark face it is said that he looked like the Christ in whose name he was bound. Around his waist were tied a large bundle of manuscript and a thick octavo printed book. The torch was applied and as the flame spread to the straw and sulphur and flashed in his eyes, there was a piercing cry that struck terror in the hearts of the bystanders. Jesus, you, thou son of the eternal God, have mercy upon me, he cried. Uh, next slide. So let's have a look at uh, geography edited by Servetes. Uh, the printed text on the title page here reads the eight books of the account of geography by Claudius Ptolemy of Alexandria, now for the first time edited according to the translation of Bibliot Perikima, but compared to the Greek and early editions by Michael Villanovas. Scholar have been added by the editor in which the obsolete names of cities have been given according to present usage. Also 50 maps have been added of the ancient as well as more recent times and the various rites and customs of the peoples are described. Lyon from the shop of the brothers Melchior and Gaspard Trexel, 1535. You can see the large woodcut printer device there, um, the image of the Trexel printers, three heads on a pedestal with wings at the base. Uh, there's a serpent and two globes with the motto Lucis Genuit, I think, which is experience bore me. Next slide, please. Woodcut ornaments um, in this copy are believed to be the work of Hans Holbein. You can see that very typical architectural framework from the period. Next slide, please. Uh, next, we have um, a beautiful diagram of an armillary sphere showing the projection of the winds. And these particular wind he heads were actually drawn by Albert Dürer. Um, and have been repeated in a number of different publications. And we have a, a full scale a print of this particular armillary sphere in the collection. Next slide. This on the next slide of the ancient world. So in this atlas, you have both modern and ancient versions of the world. This is the ancient version, which is a little bit similar to the map that we saw earlier, but you can see the beautiful um, chubby cheeked wind heads around the outside, all named, all the winds named separately. Uh, again, you can see just Northern Europe and Africa. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in this slide, you'll see um, the modern world. And of course, this one is very different because, ah, my notes have mucked up here, but I can tell you that this is um, an incredibly important map of the world. Um, it shows the first 
map they believe which has the word America on it printed in an atlas. You can see that um, you have America there, but it was printed um, just before um, Magellan returned from his circumnavigation of the globe. But you can see the world is very different and we have uh, the full scope of um, Africa. Uh, we have um, India there, China, we have Ceylon. So you can see the image of the world is developing and around the outside, you have um, all of the various winds um, in a, a very different um, decoration than the earlier um, chubby wind heads. Next slide, please. Uh, in the next slide, I think we have, um, this is um, an old version of Italy, and you can see there isn't a lot of detail. So this is the ancient view of Italy. And then if we move to the new slide, we will see the next slide shows um, a modern version of Italy with much more detail developing. Um, you can see that this um, particular double page is quite damaged. You can see um, it's been damaged by water, and I'll um, explain later that's the Mitchell copy. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, in the next slide, we have um, a modern um, image of Africa, and you can see how much detail is on the outside and on the inside. And you can see the number of different cities and towns that are actually um, engraved around the outside of Africa. Now, if you move along to the next slide, you can also see the bottom half of Africa and of course, this was a time in which Portugal, Portugal was such a, a dominant power and they had control of, they'd already sailed around the bottom of Africa. They had control of the trade in, in India. And um, so you can see here, uh, the King of um, Portugal portrayed riding uh, uh, fish, dominating the oceans there. So this sort of extra work came in the later editions of Geographia. Next slide, please. I think our next slide is of England. And um, the geography also had descriptions of the people that lived in these various countries. And according to um, Servetus text, the Irish are inhospitable, uncouth and savage. They are more devoted to hunting and athletic contests than to agricultural labor. And the Scots are of quick intelligence, ferocious and prone to vengeance. They are brave in war, very enduring of hunger and lack of sleep, of pleasing stature, but very lacking in sophistication. Very harsh, he's very harsh on a number of European nationalities. Next slide, please. So we're going to now look at the various copies that we have in the collection. Um, this is an example from the, that was owned part of the public library collection, acquired in 15, on 15th of July, 1891. Um, it's internally in very good condition, although the binding is incredibly tight and some of the information um, and maps are lost in the gutter. We don't know where it was acquired, but we, were, we paid approximately 10 pounds for the volume in 1891. Uh, next slide. Uh, you can see here the wonderful work of librarians who actually put the provenance detail in the gutter, which I think is, um, was done by a number of libraries. So we know it was bought on the 15th of um, July, 1891, and the secret code there tells us how much um, the book actually cost. So that's our public library copy. Uh, the next slide, please. This is um, the Mitchell copy, which was acquired around 1920. Um, it was require, um, acquired with Mitchell bequest funds, so it was never actually owned by David Scott Mitchell. Um, according to our accession cards, we paid £64 for this particular um, copy. The condition is not great. As you could see earlier, it's been damaged by water, um, but what it lacks in condition, it makes up for in its object appeal. You can see it is bound in vellum, um, hand inked title on the spine. And if we go to the next slide, you can actually see where some of the manuscript waste that has been used in the binding, just tucked into the gutter there. And if we go to the next slide, I think you will see in the next couple of slides as they move through, you'll see that there's quite a bit of marginalia in this particular copy, and there's been some annotations and made. Now, this is the list of the 8,000 places uh, with all of their coordinates. So someone has specifically gone into the Spanish uh, locations and added some notations. Perhaps this was owned by someone in Spain. If we could move it along, we could see the next slide where you can see this manuscript detail in more in more detail. 
Thank you. Okay, so uh, the next slide, please. The edition in the best condition is from the collection of Sir William Dixon. Um, it's not in its original binding, um, but Dixon does have fantastic documentation. It was acquired from Angus and Robinson in November 1899 for 14 pounds. This volume was originally from the library of Michael Wadhall, an English book collector and translator. His collection of books was sold in the 1880s, some making their way to Australia. And this copy is now on display in the Maps of Pacific exhibition on at the State Library. So it's on to my last slide now. Um, the legacy of Ptolemy's work is complex. Um, he enabled Renaissance scholars to reconstruct the ancient world, providing a link between the ancient and modern world. He introduced modern cartographic theories. Um, its rediscovery also launched a publishing phenomena, a text to be reviewed, debated and expanded to reflect contemporary thinking um, and spread widely across Europe through the new invention of printing. Servetus, he was a skilled editor of numerous words, works, including Ptolemy. His claims around the circulation of the blood were contested, but his religious theories had many followers. Calvin's merciless behavior in regard to Servetus lost him many followers, and following his execution, Servetus became a martyr for freedom of worship. Um, finally, can I say it's a pleasure also to find our Holy Trinity in the library's collections, which is one title in three copies, one from the Mitchell, one from the Dixon, and one from the public library collections. Final word, can I just encourage you all who are doing research that across Australia and New Zealand libraries, we have fantastic untapped printed collections. So while traveling to the Northern Hemisphere is difficult in, and in uncertain times, why not explore the collections at your doorstops? Thank you for listening, Maggie.